we have to go on forever on this but okay where were we uh, talking about uh, oh the uh, the uh, center of conflict conflicts that things that th things that were cultural that may have upset mm -hmm. the plant well, the faculty in, in the center systems were, were teaching uh, courses that were transferable, which meant they were basic courses in the disciplines, which prepared students uh, by giving, by meeting their general education requirements and introducing them to the uh, majors they would eventually adopt at other institutions. Uh, the Green Bay model didn't work for them. Uh, institutionally, but also the faculty were uh, were not necessarily sympathetic to the Green Bay model at all. And, They've uh, been hired for a very disciplinary campus. Yeah, yeah. Well, I heard there was there was problems too, and I remember hearing this myself with transferring to Madison or transferring the credits to anywhere. Those were exaggerated, I think. Were uh, they? Yeah. Uh, but they had to be worked out. Yeah. The, the uh, there were. Uh, I think very few cases where the credits themselves are not transferable, but the, the, the descriptions of the courses needed to be explained so that they understood which category the courses fit into and if indeed they, uh, uh, they supported a major field the student was in. And that was worked out over time. Uh, uh, but it was, it, was, it was upsetting, understandably, to students who uh, had thought they had met requirements uh, that they turned out not to have met, particularly if they were transferring to out-of-state institutions where uh, they had no idea what we were doing up here. But I think the, the, the culture of the center system was, was different enough then, uh, more so then than now in many respects, that uh, uh, the Green Bay idea was, uh, uh, was an object of ridicule to many of them. Mm -hmm. One of the mm -hmm. historians who, uh, or two of the historians who interviewed me in, in Boston for the job, uh, 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 were were even disdainful of, uh, of certain aspects of uh, the institution in the in the interview. Uh, some so of them, after all, they were been telling me, don't don't take seriously some of this stuff because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and of course, many of the folks in the humanities, in particular, had been at the. Yeah, these were the, the, the I should have said the two, at the two year campus who were at the two year campus had been yeah. at the two year campus, and and indeed many of them. Uh, Either did not get uh, tenure after they, they came to uh, to uh, the four-year institution, or were uh, really marginalized in uh, in their roles. Something else that needs to be fit in here, I think, that that's fairly important. UW Green Bay, to some extent, was on the cutting edge of what has become a very important part of higher education, and that is interdisciplinary education. Yes. There were a few special programs that were interdisciplinary that existed at mostly very prestigious universities, like the social thought program at the University of Chicago, uh, like the humanities program at Stanford. Uh, but by and large, universities and colleges elsewhere, particularly public universities and colleges, were set up in disciplinary ways, and that has become less so over the years. I know I won't go into the, I haven't done all of the schools, but in the UW system, I can't find a school that doesn't talk about... Interdisciplinary right. work, exactly. Right. But when you're at the beginning, at the cutting edge of something like that, people don't know what you're doing. And part of what happened, I think, is that UW-Green Bay, to some extent, burnt out pushing against that tide for so many years and having to make compromises at so many points to try to hold on to pieces of the interdisciplinary work while other places were beginning to pick up pieces of it. And you talked earlier about how did what we had done uh, transfer elsewhere. They did learn lessons from what didn't work here. So that there were ways to introduce interdisciplinary work into what were predominantly disciplinary structures and then gradually grow those interdisciplinary programs. We were busily going the other way, trying to strengthen the disciplinary programs that our students so badly wanted within what had been established as interdisciplinary structures. Now, I'm told, though, that the key interdisciplinary uh, attribute here is the budget control. Yeah. Has anybody adopted a different system of budget control or one comparable to? 
Has anybody? Yes, there okay. there are other people who have done it. Probably the best example is Evergreen State, uh, in the state of Washington. They have two advantages that we didn't have. Uh, one is that their president, not their founding president, but their second president, had formerly been the governor of the state, so he had a lot of political understanding for what is also uh, an interdisciplinary university focused on environmental issues. And secondly, they didn't adopt the UW-Madison kind of departmental and government structure. In fact, they set up a structure that has, um, that depends heavily on task, task forces that are put together for specific issues that come up based upon student, faculty, and staff interests and expertise in that particular issue rather than standing committees that are always there <clears throat> throughout time. They're also located in the state capitol, which made the political uh, yes. case uh, easier to make. I, I did want to add one other thing about the, uh, the center system faculty who transferred to Green Bay. Uh, many of them became campus leaders. Yes. Uh, uh, I think particularly of, of uh, uh, Professor Kipper, uh, Bill Kipper who eventually even became provost, or Lee Professor Schwartz, Lee before. Schwartz, who had been a dean at, at Fox Valley, who became one of the leaders in the sciences. Uh, Elmer Havens, uh, who became the, uh, the first chair of uh, the university committee of uh, UW-Green Bay. So the question was raised, or maybe some comments yeah. someone made to me, was that a cause of problems? The, the, the uh, center, you know, the reformers staff getting used to new stuff, or was that something easily overcome? It, it um, uh, <laughs> there were problems. Uh, in most cases, uh, they were overcome, but uh, the, as, a, as a group, uh, they were less sympathetic faculty, and some of them uh, really were uh, uh, marginalized. And it also created a sort of two cultures. Yes. Uh, that I think really was problematic, and I'll, I'll speak from the other side as somebody who came in part-time in the liberal education seminars and only then found my way into a regular faculty position in one of the concentrations. Um, I had responsibilities my first year as an assistant professor for heading the freshman liberal education seminar programs of 20 faculty. The curriculum working out what kinds of administrative procedures we were going to develop. I was a real young Turk. I was barely, I was still wet behind the ears coming out of graduate students. Well, that would have been in 72. I would have been 28 years old. I uh, And at a university, that's, that's pretty young to be chairing a program. Now, it was not a budgetary unit. Somebody else was responsible for budget. And very importantly, it was also not a personnel unit. We did not get to make formal recommendations on whether or not somebody was tenured. We got simply to make evaluations, which were not binding on the uh, budgetary and personnel units. They were just information being put in. So if somebody was really good at teaching those freshman interdisciplinary courses, we could say that. But the budgetary unit might think that freshman interdisciplinary courses really ought to go away and we're not interested in having that particular person as a result. So our, recommend, our evaluation might not only be ignored, but might in fact give somebody a black eye. Uh, the, uh, the governance structure was Byzantine in its <laughs> complexity. Mm -hmm. And that was very unusual because we're a relatively small institution at the time. Still, they're still not a terribly large one. They were quite small then, but the complexity of the different components of, uh, of the system was absolutely stunning. You're not talking about the all university committee, you're talking about the fact that there's all concentrations and all concentrations, options, collaterals, liberal education seminars, and then ad hoc programs like uh, uh, American Documentary Theater or another program in the arts and society. Or women's studies or that women's was across studies. four different yeah. concentrations. Yeah, and, and each of these required uh, difficult negotiations to secure faculty uh, time and, uh, and resources, uh, and the time and the resources were under uh, growing pressures. 
so that we had uh, 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 an internal politics uh, of absolutely stunning proportions for a relatively small institution. Well, thank and, you for bringing that up. I guess a, sort of a closing, I'm running low on memory now, okay. is if UW-Green Bay had gotten the dormitories that were first sought, and then would it have worked? I mean, was that sort of like the, the, uh, the thing that broke it in terms of the dream? Not by itself. I think, uh, I think uh, <laughs> the funding level needed to be maintained. The uh, uh, recruitment of out-of-state students needed to be supported. Uh, uh, the dormitories obviously were, were a major component in that support, but not the only one. Uh, you needed to, uh, to keep the message uh, alive out-of-state, to, to maintain a core of folks who came here committed to the idea. Uh, I should also say that a lot of local students uh, uh, were sold on the idea. Yes. So it's, it's yes. not simply a division local between versus, outer state and Wisconsin. Yeah. There were a lot of students from northeastern Wisconsin who come to understand the virtues of, uh, of the experiment uh, uh, at a very early stage. But there were lots who didn't. Mm -hmm. okay, I guess the same question is if, if UW-Green Bay had gotten the dormitories, would it, would it have made the difference or a big part of the difference? It it's, certainly would have made a difference, uh, but there was other stuff to be done. Jerry mentioned the funding. I would say the governance structure really needed to be designed specifically to fit this academic program rather than borrowed from Madison and superimposed on it. Uh, there needed to be a more effective way of working out the transfer issues at an earlier stage. Uh, there were a number of things that would, would have had to have happened. Uh, ideally, we would have had to have been in a different time and place. Green Bay was not an ideal place in the late 60s, early 70s for an experimental university. And the late 60s, early 70s were a pretty good time for an experimental university, but to really pull off the interdisciplinary thrust we were talking about, it would have been better to be in the late 70s, where some other folks had already done some of the, the early spade work that we ended up doing for ourselves. Okay, you agree mm -hmm. with that? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the question of Green Bay's influence uh, for historians, the question of influence is always hard to establish. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I would uh, I'd really hesitate before saying that we influenced the trend in American higher education toward but more we interdisciplinary study, but we were part among the first people to do it in a, in a really yeah. systematic and serious yeah. way. And we were publicized uh, on, on that effort. Um, but as a result, much of what we did has now come to seem old hat and not done in quite the most efficient way. What about the location, if it had been a different community? Different part of the state? Yeah. Um, different part of the country? Green Bay in the late 60s, yeah. early 70s. I mean, it's not just Green Bay. It was Green Bay at that time. Yeah, it, it was a very conservative area. I a recall. Very working class. Yeah, I recall some of the uh, the studies that were uh, sociological studies done in Wisconsin that this part of Wisconsin had the least geographic turnover. That is to say, the population had the the, the largest percentage of people who simply stayed here. <laughs> who were born with the. 50 miles of where, the, or who lived within 50 miles of where they were born was how that particular statistic yeah. ran. It was very high. And that's, that was part of the, uh, the, the area's virtue. Yes. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a genuine community, but it was also not a community that was, uh, I mean, it was a community that was quite you know, content in many respects and was not uh, you know, uh, trying to find new experiences. And, uh, <laughs> and you, new universities or new colleges often make their first connections to their community through athletic programs. Well, in Green Bay, you sure couldn't establish a major football program, could you? Because there was already a major football program in town. So you didn't want to directly compete, compete with, the, with the Packers, so instead we established soccer. But this was before the wave of interest in soccer in the U.S., so that was not very effective either. Uh, I mentioned that Green Bay was a working class community. That was one of the things that differentiated it from Appleton, which saw itself as a more middle class community and which had Lawrence University to sort of be its touchstone. Uh, 
it was more difficult for a working class community, which again is a strength. The, the work ethic in Green Bay is certainly a strength but more difficult for a working class community with many adults who had not been to college themselves to understand the value of a, of a university education. And, th and that, was, that was really a tension from early on. And then, of course, there were the paper mills, uh, at least one of which became a major supporter of UW-Green Bay. Uh, Fort Howard and, uh, and the family, uh, the Coffrin family, uh, has its name all over UW Green Bay because of the wonderful commitments that they made to the university. But by and large, that reflects really very clever work that was done by Ed Widener in articulating uh, what might be the connections for a paper company uh, from a university that uh, started out saying, we want clean water and clean air. Okay, I think I going to end here just because You're out of fatigue. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have compassion for anybody sitting here. You're being